Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> High energy already. Sass. Leave the claps in there, brother. <laughs> I will. It's your boy Chingo Bling. We are back at it again, man. Hot out the gate. Coming in hot with the Chingo chats. Y'all know we keeping it non-political. I have no idea what we're about to talk about. I actually want to start it off where um, where we kind of started off the RPT, which threw me for a loop. We were talking about this drink, which I'm just about done with. Mm-hmm. And you started talking about, or we started talking about consciousness and reality and what we observe and how it's, it's all... Uh, Objective, subjective, subjective rather, and yeah. not objective. Uh-huh. And I kind of want to continue that thought because you hadn't had any CBD. You hadn't had nothing. You were just kind of fresh off the morning. Was it a dream? Was it something you thought about last night before you fell asleep early like an old man? What exactly was it? Oh, well, honestly, I heard um, Scott Adams mentioning, uh, but I, I've, I've heard a lot about this quantum possibilities stuff. I mean... I don't know if y'all have ever gone down these rabbit holes, but just learning about like parallel universes and, you know, there's another alternate reality where Rob gets up and slaps the shit out of me. You know what I mean? <laughs> God damn. And, and it might happen in this reality. We don't know. I might say something to trigger him, <laughs> but we've all kind of probably dabbled or at least seen like a movie, uh, like uh, even Back to the Future. Like if you go back in time, you know, you're going to throw something else off and it's not going to be the same because there's like these endless possibilities. But it's kind of empowering to think about the possibility that because our, existent, our existence might be subjective, meaning it's, it's all in how you look at it kind of thing, it should be empowering to know that you can almost bend your reality. Because you got things like affirmations and things like the secret that basically say that you can kind of will your way into things. You can kind of like... If you think positive, and of course, you got to put in the work, Mm -hmm. but if you got the right mindset, things, the chips may fall. You know what I mean? Like, it's almost like once you start getting your life together, you start going to church, you just start being more focused, you start being more disciplined. All of a sudden, it's like, man, my life is just so much better. And you don't know if you're, if you should attribute all that to just better habits and you just got more positive friends and you're just doing more positive things with your time. But it might be also that you're choosing to what's the word have a certain perspective on your reality and it starts it's almost like the universe almost like some will smith shit like how will smith has those viral little speeches on the internet yeah basically some of y'all are probably familiar with some of this stuff where you know your mind is powerful and we're learning more and more i'm sure the government already knew this they just ain't told us (laughs) but they're learning more and more about like quantum possibilities like there's dark matter there's matter and why is it that um is it atoms atoms or uh, molecules or some shit i think it's atoms behave differently when they're being observed or measured so even if it's not a human or a conscious being or an animal uh, stepping into a realm and 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 letting it manifest manifest itself because if we're living in a simulation and it's like advanced quantum computing power that's creating this sim that we're in, why would it waste um, computing power generating the other side of the world that we, we can't observe mm-hmm. or, or, or a distant galaxy we can't observe? Why would it just have it be constructed at all times? It only needs to be there when we're there to observe it. Mm. Does that make sense? I know it makes sense for this conversation. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm jumping around, but it's one of those things where it's like, I don't play enough video games to know the right terms, but what does NPC stand for? Um, like non-player, computer, something. Drawing a blank. Something like that, right? But it's almost like some people in our world, in our existence, in our life, are like just... You're just little sims. Like, you're not even, you're just, you know what I'm saying? You're just taking up space. You just. Dude, little... that's how I feel about a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a ton of people. <laughs> it's it, like, people will say some dumb shit or they'll do something dumb. And I'm like, man, are you really like here? Or are you just a figment of this current, you know, universe's imagination where you're just here to fill up space and kind of wander along amongst the rest of us that are actually, and this sounds so woo woo, but like consciously awake, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Because mm-hmm. so many people are kind of you know it's like the blind leading the blind they're just like so go with the you know, go with the not go with the flow but 
it's like robotic. A lot of things that they do are very just doing it, not because there's a meaning or a purpose behind it, but it's just because that's what they've been programmed to do. Or it's almost, exactly, right? It's almost like the world that I'm engaging with, like this dream, life is but a dream. Mm -hmm. Like this dream that I'm in right now, through my point of view, is like Rob's here, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe, you know what I'm saying? It's almost like, but shit, maybe from Rob's point of view, I, I don't know. I don't know. I like it the, gets deep. It does get deep. And I like where this is going because r right now and over the last year, we've had more time to think than ever before, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the cool ideas that I'll, you know, just these random ass day thoughts. I'm sure you have the same thing, right? I'm sure we all have these random thoughts where we're just maybe driving, doing something, and then we just randomly think about something like whatever, like universe consciousness, like uh, people walking around, waste of space, some of them. But <laughs> back in the day, people... Uh, like the great thinkers had time to sit and think and philosophize, right? And worry about the problems of the world or worry about injustices. Why of the are world. we here? Is, exactly. there a, is there a God? All that. And then as life, you know, develops and gets busier, a lot of us, most of us, don't have that time anymore. We don't have that luxury. I've always thought of it as a luxury. But over the last 12 plus months, um, we've all been thinking more. We've all been you know, whether it's from the political spectrum or just life in general or the, you know, happiness and safety of my family kind of thing. And it makes you get pretty uh, introspective about what are we doing and how are we doing it? And have we been optimizing our time and our decisions? And how can I change that in the future? At least I have personally. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I went down memory lane, man. I, I like literally sat right here in this room, probably in the dark. <laughs> Was this yesterday? No. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm talking about like, in the middle of the pandemic, oh. in, in the middle of the lockdown shutdown, where you just start doubting everything and you're just like, how the fuck, where, how did I end up like, and you start beating yourself up where it's like, man, maybe if I had, you know, maybe if I had said yes to the P. Diddy deal, I could have parlayed that into something. Or maybe I, if I had said yes to that, I mean, there was a lot of record deals on the yeah. table at the time. Uh, I don't regret anything. I'm glad I told all them people no. But... When you're in this in the darkness of the abyss of you're not essential, you're not really working, you're just stuck at home and and it starts to feel like Groundhog Day where you're just like, Okay, do we go live on cafecito time? Like do I go like what am I what the fuck's going on? Are 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 there gonna be tour dates? When are things gonna open? Dude, it's not funny, but it's funny now because the things are opening up. You do have live shows, this podcast is taking off. But I'm laughing because the thought of what you just said, you were in this studio mm -hmm. with the lights off, maybe a candle burning at, <laughs> at most. Journaling <laughs> and just <laughs> looking. You no, know, seriously, dude. I like, know, I know. Look, looking back at like major, because like you said, life moves fast. And a lot of times we don't really get introspective. We don't have the opportunity to look back. And sometimes it's not really time for that. Maybe sometimes there is a season where you need to look back totally right? so i'm sitting there trying to like write okay this year all right 2012 where was i then what happened then it's like okay philly brown came out i was living in la da, da, da. you know here here's a i had this child you know boom 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 there was a breakup here um you know just what, what happened this year and you're just trying to fill in all the blanks of not like where did i go wrong or how the fuck did i end up in this <laughs> pandemic not like that so much per se but it's almost like a snapshot of your life. And you try to like summarize what big accomplishment, what was the theme of that time? Like, oh, I was in actor mode. Or, oh, this is where I started stand up. And obviously, it's like the sun is coming. Oh, I met Marisol. I met Marisol that year. I started stand up this year. And, you know, we had Penny this year and got married this year, so on and so forth. Not in that order. And, you know, took this trip, you know, started this project released this, dove into that, learned how to do this, started doing a little bit of that. And obviously there's going to be ups and downs, but um, I don't even know how we got on the subject, but um, how did we get on Just lean into it. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, guess, I guess the point is, is that, you know, sometimes in life you end up in the, where well, your back's against the wall and you're having doubts and you're very unsure about what's next you know what's next because look you know we have you know boom we have a netflix thing right there which you know their license expired it's no longer up but it's like oh that was a cool project you know what i mean and um 
obviously we're doing this podcast and and texas is lifting the ma mask mandates and mm -hmm. you know things are looking up and we got some shows coming you know but sometimes there are all those moments where you look at those possible mistakes and where they must takes mm -hmm. you know are there certain things that just make you stronger certain things that you needed to learn especially if you look at life as um a game where you need to be learning literally like a video game where you need to pick up certain keys mm -hmm. and certain uh certain wisdom and you need to bump into that you got to meet that one person that gives you that one gem and sets your path on a whole nother thing and because there are endless possibilities you know from an entrepreneur to another that's i think one of the things that really excites entrepreneurs the most is because you're always one idea away now, totally. one product away one thing one tweak one prototype one service one one system away from like you know oh shit i just saw rob on on uh fox news and he, <laughs> you know he was talking about this new thing he's developing or whatever it's like those possibilities are there and if you're gonna think something you might as well think positive you might as well you might as well lie to yourself and psych yourself out if need be because everything's subjective anyway think about it there's people on this earth you could have you could literally have two people right one could be muslim that believes like one very specific particular thing one person might be scientologist and they believe a very specific thing one person might be QAnon. another person might be in some cult another person might be atheist another person might be nihilist they believe in nothing and you got them all at heb living their life paying their bills buying their groceries providing for their families they might all could be able to sit at a park bench feed some ducks be in traffic together and they're literally coexisting with radically totally different points of view so they all have their own subjective um life structure if you will like this is what i believe in allah i believe in the, i believe in jesus christ i believe in this i believe in that their realities are subjective but yet they're able to operate perfectly fine in this world so you can think different things and get by you might as well think positive like you can literally live your life saying to yourself like i'm i'm a billionaire i'm a billionaire i got a billion you know worst case you just might have a billionaire swag like a, <laughs> a billionaire attitude you might just have a billionaire point of view and what harm is there because you could think stuff anyway it's better than thinking i'm a loser i'm a bum i made bad decisions it's way better than thinking that so you might as well think you're a billionaire <laughs> and that might shift your perspective on what you actually have to where you think that having a, a, your home whether it's big or small a car and uh food is a billionaire yeah and that would be great yeah because you're living in modern times with right. ac and heating and yeah, who's to say that's not billionaire status? Because if you go around the world, you can probably find more places than not that would yeah. say that's you're a fucking billionaire for yeah. sure. And if you have love and a family that loves you, health, you health, you might as well. I mean, you're better off than the majority. You know, if you got running water, clean water. I know sometimes we don't. <laughs> it, it happens. Ha it happens. We have every, Mother every, Nature strikes every hundred and twenty something years. <laughs> it's funny that you use the term uh, video game, though. I've been using that term for years. I, that literally used to make my father irate when I would say, "Like, look, we're all living in this video game type of life, and I, I'm trying to figure it out in a different way that you tried to figure it out or figured it out, and just give me some time or, or then look at it from my perspective." And you know, at first it was just like this old military man wasn't having it, but as he got older, I feel like uh, there's. Less one, there's less testosterone, which barely has fucking fallen off of this man. But also, he, I guess, he's just too old to argue with me. You know, he gets to the point where it's like it's not worth having that heated discussion. It's rather, it's it's better to just kind of maybe side with your son for a little bit and kind of see what happens. And you, hopefully, you prove him wrong or you prove him prove him so as far as what you were saying. Or what did he want you to do? Uh, he wanted me to be a truck driver. Mm -hmm. He has a trucking business. Okay. We have a trucking business, and he wanted me to follow in those footsteps. He wanted me to go to the Navy like he did. I didn't want to do any of those things. And for a while, that was just like, 
he, there was there was some, that was the fight that was the fight and that was you know we would butt heads on that kind of stuff and he wanted to be a rancher you know kind of like him all that stuff which is nothing wrong with it man i've learned a lot of stuff and my work ethic comes from that lifestyle but there was no way i was gonna you know break 18 in high school and continue to live the ranch style life be a truck driver go to the navy that just wasn't what i wanted to do at all i did though want to be an entrepreneur which he always was his entire life and that's kind of the only place that we kind of met you know had some similarities but I'm sure if you've got kids and they're really, especially now, the techie kids that want to be the next ninja or want to be the next whatever, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that they could do it. But I would say they definitely, they need your support. Like they need you to be on the same page somewhat more than, mm-hmm. more than you know, mm-hmm. button heads with them, if that makes sense. Yeah, parenting styles differ. And um, like, I mean, my parents, man, you know, they they were happy that I got a chance to go to college. Yeah. But, but I'm over here looking at myself like, what the fuck are you going to do with a marketing degree? <laughs> like you literally went to school to be a salesman. And uh, every time I bitch and complain about that, uh, my wife is always like, well, you, I mean, you do marketing, you, like, you used it. I mean, you learned something. I was like, I mean, barely. A lot of this shit is instinct. Yeah. A lot of this shit to me is just common sense or stuff that I observe or pick up from different places. Not necessarily like, oh yeah, at Trinity University for X amount, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. It's like I could damn near summarize what they taught me like on a page. Like y'all literally could have handed me a handout. Yeah, <laughs> you could literally like go to a free webinar and find it online right now. <clears throat> Probably what you learn. But, yeah, you know, you live and you learn. Yeah, and plus, I will say this. Um, I got to do college radio. So I feel like that, that was worth a big chunk of my um, uh, tuition. The fact that I stumbled across that. I remember being on campus. I've always been into art. Mm-hmm. So I just remember being on, on campus and um, I forget how I stumbled on into that building. Because it was, it was, the campus is spread out and it's like hilly. It's in San Antonio. Mm-hmm. So you got like upper campus, lower campus, and you got like these stairs and shit you got to go up and all these different buildings. And can't remember how I landed in that one particular area it was like oh okay what's what's on the other side of this uh little patio esplanade thing okay there's a little open corridor thing all right let's go in this door and then i make a left and is that a fucking radio station what is those microphones and stuff and records and people talking i was like did i get off campus did i make a wrong turn like is this some company that's on campus and they're just like no that's the uh media department and i was like but the guy in there, he's talking. Yeah, he's on the radio. He's on air right now. Wait, you can go tune into this shit? It's like, yeah, it's classical and jazz. But, and I was like, so how can I do that? They're like, well, you got to take certain classes. Maybe you need to choose a minor that can allow you to do that. And, you know, you can even have your own show on there. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> and nobody was jumping on this. They even would play it. We had this thing called Tiger TV, where there was a channel that you, it was like, in the student center, in the cafeteria, and in the in the dorm rooms, where if you happen to be on that channel, it'd be like someone doing a little talk show, or um, or it'd be broadcasting what's playing on Trinity Radio or whatever. So I would literally be playing hip hop on a Sunday night, and if the TV was on at the, at the at the student center, like motherfuckers would hear us talking just like this yeah. with some rap beats. Or having like, oh, we got a little flip in here today. Or oh, we're about to play some Big Mo. And uh, shout out to some of the local artists we're playing. Da, da, da. I-, I might be on there freestyling. That's where I first started like messing around a little bit more with like rap. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people would call in. And they'd be like, hey, fool. Like, hey, man, you're pretty good, dog. Like, hey, keep that shit up. And we'd get fan mail. Oh, that's cool. People from jail, mostly. <laughs> um, How old are you at the time? I mean, I was in college. So I might have been, let me see, 19, 19 20, 21. Something like that, 19, 20, 21. And uh, we had that show for a couple years. And we were on it Sunday night, which was considered like a bad time to be on. But it was good for us because Sunday night is when everybody used to cruise on military drive. Oh, right. So it San Antonio was ratchet, still is. And down there in military, it was just like, it was like, you know, the butterfly, uh-uh, that's so Like everybody was just like, it was like... It was like Kappa Beach Party, Bike Week. It was like Freak Nick. It was like Spring Break every Sunday night. Hoochie Mama 
type of action. And the cops would try to regulate people cruising, like, oh, hey, fool, hey, meet up over there in the Taco Bell parking lot. It's like, oh, shit, the cops are there. Meet, meet me at the AutoZone parking lot. Like, shit that's closed, but people will congregate, like, oh, shit, they showing titties over there. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, that we had a street team out there passing out little flyers and telling people, hey, put it on 91.7. So all the local artists that we would play, like, there was uh, some local labels. Last Hour Records, Tone City Records, a, a, a bunch of different, uh, this one little group called PMG, Para Mi Gente, like just up and comers that were, I guess, part of like um, slanging CDs at the flea market. That's where I got schooled. Like, yeah, so how does this work? Where does everybody go? Um, I learned a lot from those cats, you know, how to record, how to get in the studio, how to rhyme stuff. And they were the ones spreading the word because I'd be like, yo, that's track six on your album if you take the cuss words out i'm gonna play that shit every sunday and they'd be like fuck yeah and it'd be like that's your hottest song and it's like hey man that song y'all working on please finish it some people wouldn't really listen like ah oh, man you know we're still working on it it's like all right whatever but um did you have any kind of lead in to your show or was it you kicking off sunday nights what do you mean lead in like you know like on tv like you know fraser was the lead in to like seinfeld or no i think it was like something that was like pre-recorded oh. regular like and you're listening to 91.7 FM, KRTU. Like, uh, but there was no show before you? It was probably pre-recorded. Oh, just pre-recorded. No, okay. Nobody was really in there before us, like doing like a... But like, you were live, right? Yeah, we went on live. That's cool. And we had turntables and um, it was dope. Like my buddy Sean, he was, um, he was like the other DJ mainly, Sean Jumps. He, he's a teacher now at a prep school in uh, New Hampshire. At an elite prep school, it's called a Phillips Exeter Academy. Mm. It's like one of the most expensive uh, prep schools. And uh, we, we were out there, remember, when we went to Boston? Mm. And I was out there. We went to uh, Maine. We went to New Hampshire. We were out there in that area. And I was like, man, I feel like I know somebody out here. I was like, wait a minute. Let me go to my text messages with Sean. And let me look, and I'm scrolling. Hey, where do you live? I was like, dude. I text him. Hey, man, we're out here in New Hampshire. He's like, oh, fuck. I live, you know. Are you still here? How long y'all gonna be here? I was like, man, we're already headed back to Boston uh -huh. or whatever. But um, but that's where the Chingo Bling persona was created. Right. Because I'd be like, yo, it's you know, it's the hip hop chop shop. We in here, you know, y'all tuning in. Shout out to the uh, the mail we got. Shout out, you know, we're sending out shout outs. We're trying to make it hype. Meanwhile, people are probably in their dorm room if they're watching uh, Tiger TV. They're probably like, what the fuck is this ghetto ass shit? But check this out, Rob. When we started DJing on campus, like parties, like frat parties and sororities and stuff, in the beginning, we would try to guess what these white folk wanted. So we're like, okay, we got to play like some pop. We got to, we can't get too ghetto. They might not know what Rec Shop Records is. We can't play that, like that new Big Mo and all this Swisher House stuff. So we, we were trying to guess what these people wanted. One time we happened to do this one frat house. And I think me and my boy, uh, the other DJ, Donnie, I think at one point we're like, okay, man, we're out of these. We don't have any more of these like safe pop CDs. We might have to start getting into our records, the shit we play on Sunday night, like some H-Town shit. Yeah. And, uh, and he's just like, man, I don't care no more, man. I, let's at least have fun for us. Because it was a struggle. We would literally show up to these frat houses when they're having a party with like my homeboy. He was my roommate, Donnie. His Ford Probe, full with like these speakers. <laughs> His Ford Probe, yeah, dope. it's a hatchback <laughs> yeah. type of thing. So you got speakers crammed in there, and we're showing up like trying to be salesmen. Hey, what's up, man? We go to uh, Trinity, like y'all. Um, you know, we got the equipment, man. You know, we're free. We're down to DJ. It, you know, hundred bucks or something. They'd be like, uh, "Yeah, we're good, dog." And it's like, okay, who's the owner? Like, who's the head of the front? Nah, man, we're good. And I'm like, okay, fifty dollars. Nah, man, we got it. Because at the time, they would just have kegs, and they might have like a little speaker in the living room. Yeah. And maybe there was a dance floor, but they weren't turning up. They were just mainly drinking, trying to hook up with chicks. They were like, we'll do the shit for free. And they're like, nah, we're cool. It's like, fuck. Motherfucker. So, so we would be so discouraged. And the, the third guy, Sean, who lives in New Hampshire, he'd be like, guys, he was from Katy. He'd be like, guys, I just don't feel comfortable like pushing my business on others like i don't feel we need to be pulling up like this and then <laughs> donnie will be like man what the fuck you mean sean he's a black dude from missouri city 
So he'd be like, dog, like, it's, it's what you got to do. You got to pull up. Like, what's wrong with you? You have to offer your services. And he'd be like, I just don't feel comfortable because he was very shy. Anyway, when we made the choice to be like, all right, fuck it. This is a pain. We, we might as well at least have fun. We start playing some ratchet shit. Boy, these motherfuckers. Oh, that's what they wanted. <laughs> that's what they wanted. Because a lot of them were from Houston, too. Yeah. Or Texas. Most of them, I'm sure. And white people buy rap music. Mm-hmm. And they were familiar. And they were up on game. And, uh, you know, they tried to tip us with mushrooms and shit. Ta- and I was like, what the fuck is this? It's like a chewed up piece of gum. It's like, nah, dude. It's shroom. Man, you could have had that shroom experience early on in oh, life. I should have. Did you uh, ever try to pledge or have any interest or need to go into a, uh, to a sorority, a fraternity? Yeah. I was in a business fraternity. Really? It's called Alpha Kappa Psi. And Sounds like what they all were called. Right? It's yeah. all like this Latin Greek. alphabet. Yeah, whatever the fuck it was. <laughs> but um, I was probably the worst member just because like I was doing the bare minimum. It wasn't a social fraternity. It was a business fraternity. So like... They motherfuckers had meetings and shit, and you had to wear a little suit. It wasn't it, a party you were turning up to? No, it was more like, man, I guess I need this for my resume. Okay, yeah. And um, and they tried to make it fun. They tried to make it cool. Like, they they didn't haze us, but they would try to have little rituals. Like, mm-hmm. like I remember one time, this is funny, when we were, I guess, rushing or applying or whatever, um... There was like certain stuff, not like an application, but certain things you had to do and turn in because they were going to review it and see if you were really down. And then they had like this little fake ass seance type of thing with some candles and they try to like fucking build a bird group. Yeah, they try to like throw. I'm not supposed to be saying the secrets of what went down, <laughs> but they would try to like kind of haze you in a way like, but, but let me rewind. So there were some things you had to do to turn in. One of them is like you had to like either write a poem or something about a, a thing about something about alpha kappa psi or some shit my shit was like a rap damn near so where i'm like saying you know i don't know what the fuck i said but <laughs> but they were impressed and they must have read it like it's a rap because uh-huh. they were like now your your poem here your dude you're rhyming on here and they're like it almost feels like it needs a little a little breakbeat behind it, and I'm just like, okay, are they making fun of me? And they're just like, can you can you can you read it? You know, and they're just like, man, that's really good. And I was like, I didn't. I guess I'm, I'm, I You're might like, turn into thanks, a rapper. Yeah, they maybe they're the ones that encouraged me. Like, hey man, that's you, funny. You, that and on top of the people that would call to the radio station, like, hey man, you're kind of good, bro. If you stick with it. And then once I started doing my chingo bling raps, slanging them at the flea market. Um, shout out to the flea market, baby. Hey, if you're in business and whether you're trying to have like some teas or um, any type of little prototype, you should be willing to take your prototype to these, uh, what, what's the word? Like the uh, farmer's markets? Yeah, to farmer's markets and things like that. Like back when I had my supplements, that's probably, I didn't really have time for all that at the time. But anyway, shout out to the flea market. And uh, when I started putting out my Chingo Bling raps on my mixtapes, first I would do like generic mixtapes where I would blend in like the hottest new shit. Like I might take like the beat to this and put the acapella from that. I might take um, Mary J. Blige acapella, put it over a big mo instrumental and I'm and just mixing it all up. Acapellas and instrumentals and blends and drops. Yo, what it do? This your boy Paul Wow. You checking in. Da, 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 da. And, and uh, you know putting it out there and people would be like hey man what what else you got that got chingo on it and i'm like i'm like in, in my head i'm like that's me you know that's me they don't know that's me but that was me so i'm like yeah you like him yeah man he's, he's dope all my kids all my friends in middle school whatever kid however young these kids were yeah all my friends at school you know they like him and i'm like oh shit and it's like they're like when's he gonna put something out i'll let them know i'll let them know and they'll be like Man, and they'll whisper to their friend, man, when Chingo drop his shit, we're going to come get it. All right, fool. And I'm like, what? That's funny. So then I started sprinkling more Chingo raps. Like, okay, I got to put at least three freestyles. And I would tell myself, because I was like, at this point, I had already graduated and I had a six month lease at some apartments. And I had my little setup, my little one bedroom apartment, my DJ stuff. And I'm like, man, I got to record myself doing some more of these freestyles. What beat am I going to rap on? What am I going to say? I'm new to this. I don't know. You know, but everything slowly started progressing. 
because we're living in this world of quantum possibilities <laughs> and you might as well think positive and it's never too late you know what i'm saying the minute you think oh this person oh man you know like the comments oh chingo you fell off i remember when da, 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 da. boy this boy fell off so bad i remember when da, 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 da. it's like you think it's over because <laughs> we might surprise you you, ha you don't even know what else might pop off. You don't know what else we might evolve into. Every time people say, stay in your lane, that is the worst advice you could ever give or take. Don't ever stay in your lane. Don't ever stay in your lane. We wouldn't be flying airplanes if the Wright brothers who had a bicycle shop had decided to step out of their lane. People step out of their lane all the time. And sometimes that's the biggest shit they ever end up doing. That's why the United States is so great because we have all these uh, innovators and risk takers. And one of the things that we were also given basically by the founding fathers was um, the ability to start over, which is now known as bankruptcy. If you take a risk in the United States and you start a business that doesn't work, you are allowed to start over. And that's how we have a lot of the stuff that we have now was because of these risk takers, the people that went outside of the box over and over again until they got it right. Or they got it right on the first time and we were able to benefit and grow faster than other parts of the world. Yeah, I guess that's part of um, like free market capitalism. Yeah. And, and one word you said, very important, is innovation. And um, a lot of times when you have, not to get political, because I know this is Chingo Chats, but a lot of times when you live in a country that's more, let's say Cuba, right? More communist, mm -hmm. socialist or whatever, there's no incentive. And that's, that's one of the economic terms that I've been hearing a lot more about and learning is that with capitalism, they factored in human nature and, you know, you have to give humans incentives. You have to incentivize people if you want to make them do stuff, if you want them to wear a mask, if you want them to social distance. Like, there's going to be friction that keeps you from doing stuff and there's going to be, like, incentives that's going to hopefully get you to do it. And um, what Rob just mentioned is, like, this free market capitalist society we live in you know even with our power grid thing you had it to where i guess here in texas the you have different uh, it's deregulated so you have different light companies that can compete with the rates right and stuff like that that a lot of people don't really fully understand and that's why they're just like oh y'all's grid fell off and it's like you don't even know what the fuck don't worry about our grid bitch <laughs> <laughs> mind your business our grid is just fucking fine uh, let's go back to what you're saying because I, I like that message of you might as well think positively like when i first started using uh the first social media platform i really cared about was twitter which ironically i care least about now because mm -hmm. it's such a cesspool of nonsense garbage but it is fun to get news and important topics about stuff or information about stuff uh, like as it's happening that's mm -hmm. like the only thing it has above all the other platforms but I used to have in my bio, like, I forgot what it was, but one thing I remember adding and it kept for a long time was um, something, something, and then just like, you know, focused on the delusional aspirations. Because everything that we do is literally a delusional aspiration when you are an entrepreneur or an artist or somebody that thinks outside of the box and constantly is choosing a new lane or switching into a new lane. They're all delusional aspirations. You know, I went to school with people who are now in the MLB. I went to school with people that played in the NFL. You know how insane it is for these kids in a small 200, mm -hmm. you know, student class, graduating class to go to the NFL? <laughs> Bro. Be okay. A, be a rapper, but go on. Sam Tripoli texted me. Oh, yeah? Yesterday. He hit me up on Twitter. He's like, at Chingo Bling, let's podcast, brother, or something. And I was like, tell XG, let's go. Nice. And, and I look at my mentions, and there's like, bing, 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 bing. People are just like, y'all need to make this shit happen now. Like, oh, fuck. What the fuck? Ah, people's brains are exploding. Because I didn't stay in my lane and because we live with endless possibilities. So if you rewind, I was just a dumbass little kid in college who happened to stumble across this hallway that had this media department with the radio station. Fast forward, I'm getting calls from P. Diddy and Master P and mm -hmm. uh, Capitol Records and they flying you out. And uh, I had a meeting scheduled with uh, Rockefeller and Jay-Z, but then they heard I signed already to Asylum. So they're like, no, nah, we're cool. We're not going to waste our time. And I'm like, fuck. So you have like having a meeting with Lear Cohen, the guy that I used to do skits about on my mixtapes saying like, oh, Lior, you're at the me put up your record label way. And it's like, we want to sign you to Def Jam record or whatever. I would do a stupid voice. I even did a voice where... 
Donald Trump was trying to sign me uh, on one of my mixtapes. And I was just like, ¿Sabes qué, Donald? Yo ya tengo mi propia record label or whatever, right? That's funny. And um, so think about it. It's like you were a dumbass little kid eating ramen noodles and frozen pizzas in a one-bedroom apartment. And you parlayed that into a motherfucking Netflix special? Yeah. And now Sam Tripoli texting you? <laughs> <laughs> what's next joe rogan you never know he lives in I mean, austin he, yeah he's right up the street i could pull up he's closer than ever before i could pull up and Dude. now you know and it's and it's weird because it's like the marbles and the molecules are bumping into each other and that's why you should never stay in your own lane people that's the lamest shit people love saying that like they know something they love saying that like they're smart just stay in your lane i'm following you because of comedy I, that's the beauty about this whole human experience for me personally and it's always been to push that boundary as far as it can possibly go have there been times where i was like wow i may have pushed this risk a little too far yeah definitely but you overcome it and you when your back's against the wall like you were saying earlier do you not find yourself to always find a way to solve the problem or circumnavigate it in a way that it gets you to the next milestone or the next part that you need to get to that you probably wouldn't have got to had you not seen some resistance based off a future or a past risk, you know? Or even to look at things different. Yeah. And that's, I don't know, that's again, part of this human experience where like the great thinkers back in the day when they had the time to think and solve those problems or write these books that we still, you know, quote to this day. We, we, we're going through that right now actively because of the pandemic, but also because we're just constantly curious. I think it's important for us to all be constantly curious. Mm -hmm. Open-minded. Yeah. And be willing, be flexible, be willing to let things go that no longer serve you. Look back only when you need to, but definitely PMA, positive mental attitude for sure, especially in the morning. If you can make that part of your morning routine, like uh, I feel like such a mandilon, right? Because... Yesterday, I was trying to pick up a little bit, and uh, I found some old pictures that Mighty Soul had developed, and I'm going through them, and it's like, oh, look at this. We're all lovey-dovey. We're all smooching over here. We're over here in Cancun, smooching. We're over here smooching on the Eiffel Tower. We're over here at this concert, smooching, and um, uh, you know, she's such a great step stepmom to my 12-year-old, so she met Mickey when she was like five or something, five maybe, five maybe going on six, and... Um, you know, she's helping me pick out her little outfits yeah. and help, you know, help dress her a certain way and do her room, redecorate her room and, and all these nice things and uh, taking her to activities. And anyway, my point, man, what the, how the fuck did I get on this subject? <laughs> what were you saying right before this? Uh, you know, being curious. Oh, um, morning routine. Oh, yes. Sorry. Positive mental attitude, morning routine. So I'm going through these pictures and I start setting aside a few and then, uh, like the ones with Mickey in them when she's all little and chimuela, like her little t missing teeth and that little phase. And just showing how long she's known Sol, how long we've been a little family. And I, I went and put all those pictures in her room to see, you know, maybe we make an album or frame some of them just to always have a constant reminder. This is your home. You know, she's at her mom's half the time. But this is your home, too. Don't be like, oh, it's at home at my mom's. It's like, no, 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 you're at your dad's. And this is your home too. And um, so the morning routine thing is I'm a mandilon and I put some of the pictures of like me and Sol, just little nice family reminders of like, oh, that's when we went to Costa Rica. And oh my God, I remember that. And oh, that's a nice beach. Oh my God, that was Hawaii. And I put them up. I have this mirror on my nightstand. I just like slid them in there, like in the, in the, to where they stuck in the frame. And it's like, oh, I'm such a mandilon. And uh, it's just a nice reminder, right? It's just something you kind of, because sometimes we get so caught up in the rat race, especially with like politics and, you know, are we locked down? And, you know, it, what's my stand-up career looking like? Is that, is it, is, are people too sensitive? Are they going to be too afraid to go out? And it's good to have those reminders. And um, like even something, I saw this on um, on the internet somewhere, but a mom had pasted or glued, whatever, these little affirmations for her son. And he's like there brushing his teeth in the mirror. And I think it was like overlaid on top of the mirror. And I'm like, see, that's good. Because this parent obviously understands the power of those little reminders and those affirmations and positive thinking. And to where it's like, fuck, maybe I don't do enough of that. Like I need some more fucking reminders you know, because that could set your day 
on a completely different course. You might just be more agreeable. You might just, you know, nicer to hang out with. People invite you to more shit. So yeah. Just like, Fucking grumpy Gus. <laughs> uh, to go back to what you were saying about just stumbling on that hallway where you saw the, the radio stuff going down and like, well, I want to do this. Who isn't doing this? I, I feel the same way about podcasting, man, because 12, 10, 12 years ago, when I first heard what a podcast was, I was immediately like, blown away, right? Because I remember talking on a previous podcast how I would like record myself doing voiceover stuff or I'd record myself doing whatever. There was something about recording your voice and recording something that was always appealing and attractive. The music thing was always attractive, but we were always too broke to get instruments. So I never thought I could get a guitar or a drum set and record that until I was way older. So I never thought I'm going to be a musician, even though I would, that would have been great, right? But um, recording your voice was so simple. You just record something, you put it out, you know, you could do whatever. And then as I got older and right after I dropped out of, out of college, started working this bullshit, you know, type of office job lifestyle that was like, this is terrible. Hearing Rogan and Corolla and all these early voices of podcasting, Bill Burr, was like, man, I want to do this, right? Like, there's something here. And to see where podcasting has come in 10 years, it's like, wow, I was right. Like, there was something here. Mm -hmm. got, Absolutely. Got to talk to a ton of people, interview some of the coolest people that I looked up to, you know, you included, obviously. We didn't podcast together. I mean, now we do it, but I didn't ever reach out to you to do a podcast. But like, um, Adam Scorgi, who we had on What Do You Said a long time ago, and Daniele Bolelli, who was on Rogan early on in the day, uh, and fucking even Alex Jones and musicians and stuff, all these experiences that came through podcasting and interviewing and talking and and you know lane to lane i like this i like that let's talk to that person can i reach out to them and opening doors and opportunities and things that at some point money can't even buy like once you start doing some stuff with certain people it's like there's i couldn't have paid for this i had to have met somebody uh built a relationship with somebody in order to get access to do this what's the name of the guy that invented the rss feed and all that uh adam curry yeah no agenda shout out adam curry um what you just described is powerful because it goes back to that thing, which is there's endless possibilities, opportunities always around the corner. That's what always attracted me to, um, you know, business, entrepreneurship, um, being a CEO, owning your catalog, owning your masters, you know, looking at people like Jay Prince and how he has like a thousand acres in Texas and an island off of Honduras or Belize and so on and so forth. It's always like these are were regular people at some point, yeah. but had this imagination and and um and yeah, you were definitely right, man. Like podcasting is powerful, and hopefully people are listening and they appreciate yeah. they appreciate this medium and this discourse, and they can see a different side of me instead of always seeing like the TikTok or the skit or mm -hmm. the the. The, the joke on stage or the song you just heard the mixed down version you didn't see the process or or get to really know the person behind the fucking madness like yeah. how'd you come up with this how'd you come up with that mm -hmm. that's the idea of the chingo chats right and it's kind of similar to adam carolla's story i recently heard him on uh whiskey ginger with andrew santino he loved radio right he loved talking he was i think uh before he was I think he was a janitor. He ended up being a janitor, I think, at K-Rock or whatever it was in, in California. But before that, you know, he was teaching uh, boxing and stuff. And he was a carpenter, obviously. Like, he built homes and all that kind of stuff. Met Kimmel through some coincidental, like, elevator meeting or something. Or, like, just run in. On the radio at K-Rock? Yeah, uh, in the hallways. Yeah, of okay. the studio. Like, he wanted... Uh, so, do you know the story where Kimmel was looking for a boxing coach? Mm. He said it on air to wh whoever his co-host was at the time. And um, Corolla heard it. And he just walked into K-Rock... And just basically like, I'm the guy that's going to train Jimmy Kimmel. I'm the guy. So that's how that relationship ended up building. He but he go. was already working there. No, no, no. no. Oh. He, was, he was still just doing carpentry and do, oh. being a boxing coach. He heard it on the radio and walked in. Yep. And, and uh, nobody let him in. Nobody let him in day after day, day after day. Until finally, he just happened to have Kimmel walk out at the, at the right time or made it in because he may have said he worked there or something. Got into the elevator that Kimmel happened to walk in. He's like, hey, I've been hearing about the contest you want to have. I'm, I'm going to be your trainer. And I think I'm going to do it for free or whatever. And they built this bond and they've been best friends you know, for so, such a long time. Even though one's lefty Larry. I know, right? Unfortunately, yeah, it's not the same Kimmel from 25 years ago. I'm sure. But uh, he was, anyway, fast forward to now, he's like, I always, once I started getting on the radio and having uh, spots or having little appearances to do voices or characters or whatever, I knew that that's what I wanted to do, right? I wanted to talk. And then when I would tell people that what, what I want to do is sit 
and just talk for a living. They were like, you're out of your mind. Go build a house, go do whatever, go, you know, whatever, keep doing what you're doing as a business. That's not something you can do. Meanwhile, there's people on the radio doing that for a living. Why couldn't Adam, Adam Carolla do it? He's like, I'm not going to stop talking until somebody pays me enough to do this for a living. And then you have Adam Carolla. It's just like, that's what he, that's what he decided to do. Say that he, maybe he put it out into the universe and then worked on it, and manifested it, whatever, law of attraction, however you want to put it. Yeah. You do it or you don't become Adam Carolla. Yeah. Well, thank God for podcasting because, I mean, why no one's ever hired me to do terrestrial radio is beyond me, Rob. That's true. Do you ever try that? Well, I had an offer to do a morning show in Sacra- Stockton or Sacramento, California. Stockton, motherfucker. It has yeah, Stockton slap. <laughs> this was around, if I had to guess, like I think in 08, I dropped the candle porters all. And that was a fucking headache. That didn't really pan out. I learned a lot of lessons about the music business, and that was just a, a blow to the ego, and it just a fucking putazo to the stomach. So it was around 08, and it might have been a couple years after that where I was just kind of like down, trying to just pick up the pieces, try to put a team together, try to just so disillusioned with everything. The music business, I was like, this is not fun. This is not what was fucking cracked up to be. And there was this um, radio consultant. So I forget his name, but he was like a regional program director. So he had like, let's just say a dozen radio stations that he would say, all right, you motherfuckers are playing this. Because a lot of times people think that it's the DJ picking the songs like, oh, new, new song from such and such. It's like, no, no, no. All that was predetermined by another dude in his office in a... um, office building and and there's 15 other stations playing the same fucking thing (laughs) or whatever and maybe in two weeks he'll he'll send a revised anyway he's like hey man i think you'd be good for this um they're looking for a morning show host because uh they're having problems with the one they have now and it would probably be between like you and another guy y'all are in the runnings well at the time um my ex she was pregnant with uh mickey my 12 year old and basically she was just kind of like i don't know anybody in california um i'm not about to have this baby out in california without knowing nobody and whatever they're offering i forget i forget what the dollar amount was when you translate it to their expenses out there it's not as much as it seems Mm. and i was just like okay i was like well i was hoping thinking that maybe this would be refreshing to do something else instead of banging my head against the wall dealing with this fucking music industry crap you know being blackballed from radio stations and just the politics of like just a fucking letdown Mm. a big fucking letdown and i was like sorry dude my bad i can't do it so that was like one of the only times and then another time it was some shit I was doing for free, which it was a thing called What Would Chingo Do? It was like a little jingle. Again, it might have been like the year 2011 or something, just trying to figure it out, trying to pick up the pieces. Am I doing another album? Where's my music career going? Uh, why am I still doing nightclubs? You know, Why am I not doing arenas? Do I need to put a band together? Do I need some musicians to back me up? Uh, backup dancers and shit, but there's no budget for that. Anyway, it was that type of time period. And I was doing this segment with a handful of radio stations that I like knew the morning show DJ or something. And I like Xavier in San Antonio. Yeah, 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 man. I'd love that segment. I forget who who gave me the initial green light. <laughs> what would Chingo do? Yeah, it was a, a do, 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 do. I made the little thing. And basically, it would be a question from like my Google voice. So it'd be an audio. Like, hey, Chingo, I think my chick's cheating on me. And da, 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 da. What would you do, fool? It's like, well, first of all, puto, you know, I couldn't cuss, but it'd be like something stupid. It'd yeah. be like bad advice. It'd be just whatever. And I didn't do it long enough to um, maybe get good at it, but it was just a pain in the ass because I was having to like, oh, man, I got to knock out like five of these and then maybe I'm good for the week and I'm having to email it out. It was a one-man band. I'm emailing it out to the Laredo, Laredo radio station, the San Antonio. I think Phoenix was the first one. And boom, boom, boom. I think the dude in Phoenix still has uh, a grudge with me over this. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because it was one of those nights where I got into it with my baby mama. 
uh, I forget what the argument was. Long story short, it's like, all right, fuck this shit. I'm, I can't be here anymore. And I forget, I think one of my friends was there. I was like, hey, dude, give me a ride. I'm going to my dad's or something. And I just like packed up the computer or whatever. I was like, this shit's due, but um, they're not paying me. I'm not getting enough feedback. It's not like I'm people all up on my MySpace at the time. Like, oh my God, San Antonio loves when you do what would Chingo do? It's just a little fucking segment. It's not the Chingo Bling show. Yeah. And I was just like, what the fuck am I doing? I was like, you know what? Uh, forget, forget all this nonsense. I just wanted to like, yeah, they have in Pazway. Just so disillusioned. You know what I mean? Just so uh, jaded and just down yeah. about like, I, I don't want to be entitled. Like, oh, I should have my own segment. You know, I'm a, I'm a treasure of Texas and I, I, I deserve to be on um, somebody's airwaves, yeah. you know, especially maybe because I had the college radio background. But I was just like, all right, sorry, guys. I just sent them an email like, I mean, you're not paying me. Yeah. You're not paying me. You're not giving me a dime. How mad can you be? It's not like there's a billboard with my face on it, like featuring, you know, part of the part of the crew. It wasn't even like that. It's just like. You're just f like the, um, did you ever hear Carmen calls? That the, sounds familiar. Uh, oh, I think we got disconnected. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a dude named Rico. Mm. He's like, um, like a radio guru. He, he comes from that world and he was getting paid, paid. Like he, uh, he had it set up to where like he's either licensing this stuff out or something, but the more stations he could pick up, motherfucker was banking. I was doing none of that. So anyway, I sent the email like, I forget what it was. Hey guys, sorry, but I can't do the shit no more. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, I should have definitely stayed in my lane. <laughs> no, but anyway, the reason, the long story short, it's like, you would think, you would think, Ching, maybe I'm not trying hard enough. I really don't want to do the shit no more. I'm glad with, I'm happy with what we're doing now. Yeah. Because I can't do this. Absolutely not. All Everything we're doing right now, no, they would already been cut to commercial. And that's exactly why it's not, I mean, I, I, loved, I liked it as well, right? Radio and <laughs> TV, entertainment in general. But at the time, like even just being on the news or the radio, it was so restrictive. And there was a certain cadence you had to have and a certain like wacky and wild radio time, you know, all these mm -hmm, fucking mm -hmm. real cringy type yeah. shit to me. But people loved it. And if they didn't love it, which I came to find out later, a lot of people didn't, they <laughs> they, they didn't love it. Because I know some pretty big people in, um, or big people, I know some people that do some big radio still in Canada because I've met a lot of cool Canadians. What? Yeah. And I, you know, and like, because Scorgy, Adam Scorgy, who produces great, great documentaries, uh, is from there. And I met some of his friends and got to interview one uh, in a huge market. I think now he's in Toronto or, or, or Chilliwack or something. I don't know. But it's it's a grind, man. And these guys, just like news reporters, end up going from market to market, doing, you know, 4 a.m. shows. that They fucking are like, man, how long am I going to be doing this 4 a.m. show until I can get to like a mid-morning spot or midday or evening or whatever? And it's such a grind that to me, I was like, because at the time, podcasting was already really like it was ramping up, you know, in the... 10 11 12 i'm like okay well this is exactly what's going on here 20 2010 2011 2010 2011 that's really starting to take off like itunes hadn't made podcasting its own they didn't make its own app until like probably five or six years ago mm. it was buried in the app store so when you open your app store right now it's all the apps what well, used to be at the very bottom like hidden as a category you'd pick it and you'd see all the top charts it was like this week in tech adam carolla you know rogan and uh sports or whatever and it, to me, it was like, these people are alive. Okay, that's a benefit. If you're driving to work, people are going to like that. And it's like, what's going on right now? But all the commercials, all the all the like shitty like content that you're had to be terrestrial, terrestrial radio. radio yeah that had to be produced on a daily basis um you're walking on eggshells they might fire, on they might yep. fire you yeah and then they would a lot of these radio djs pobrecitos they be fucking them like they'll say all right look i know we pay you this much to be on in this market but now you also have to do san jose albuquerque and phoenix and lubbock and we're just gonna pay you a little bit more but now we're just gonna like swap out a couple things and and then you're just gonna send it out yeah uh however some folks when you like own your shit and you just got like a big contract and you or you're uh, you're syndicated in a way to where the stations are having to i guess break you off per commercial like a, a piece of the ad dollars mm -hmm. from that market right like focus for the locals i think they they did they made some good bread when they were on a whole bunch of cities sunday nights and they played people like me thankfully that was like the only radio play i had to wait till sunday night 
you know, to get played with them. And um, so shout outs to them. And then like Michael Berry, obviously, big talk radio syndicated. Uh, even my homeboy Tino Cacino, who I met when he was like 17 or something like in the panhandle in Lubbock. Where he was just a little kid and he was like, I'm the youngest DJ to ever be on air in this market. And then, like, I bump into him, like, a couple years later. It's like, hey, man, I'm 22 now, and, like, I'm, I'm in San Antonio now. I'm on a real radio station. I'm a real boy. <laughs> I'm a real boy. Yeah, I'm a real boy, and I'm on a real radio station. <laughs> now, now he's, like, syndicated, syndicated. He's in a whole bunch of markets. And, um, and yeah, he's doing real well. So, uh, you know, if that's your thing, salute. Shout outs to y'all. But people like Rob and myself, yeah. we want to be able to be honest be vocal about what we feel what we believe what we think for however long we if we want to do a two-hour show we can yeah and man. there's no there's not a boss saying hey man we got to talk about clorox bleach right now bro <laughs> yeah exactly and if you want to like and you said it perfectly which i hadn't said or heard this phrase in a long time but on the last episode or last week whenever it was you said uh i think we we're talking about frank and he had he was expressing to you how your vibe attracts your tribe love that phrase so much i remember hearing it a lot years ago and i'm glad you said it because it's absolutely true like with this, like I, uh, I don't know if I told you, but um, I, I was cleaning my office at home and I have so much audio equipment, you know, from the years of, of, you know, new mic, new board, new this, new that, new field recorder, whatever, until I got this roadcaster recently. And I remember starting on an iPhone 3G. Like I started podcasting on an iPhone 3. It was a field recorder app on the iPhone that you could then make the wave into an MP3 and upload it to uh, like a feed burner before RSS feeds were like readily available. There was this thing called like feed burner that would also syndicate it in a way that uh, Lipsyn or I guess Anchor now does. Uh, it was way more complicated back then. But anyway, now it's so easy to just create your own show. And granted, it might take 10 years, 15, 20 years for this to take off. But if you're consistent with it and like it enough, and feel like you can provide enough interview, funny, whatever content, there's just no way it won't reach a certain amount of people after a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. But now you don't need just a cell phone. Like I know Anchor really says like, yeah, record on the phone, but no, no, no. You, you can get so much tech and audio equipment for such a, like a, a reasonable price these days and not have to be beholden to the scripts and the platform and you know the guidelines of the FCC or whatever, which maybe that'll come for podcasting eventually, but mm, you know, hell no. Right. But um it's just, yeah, man, from from iPhone 3G to, you know, field recorders, mixers, and all these new things that have been coming out over the years. How did it sound on the iPhone 3G? It didn't sound bad. It actually kind of sounded like the way a phone caller sounds when you call into a radio station, you know, oh. and it sounds like you're on a phone, you can tell that it's oh. not that great. But you still had things like like levelers uh, that would, you just dump the file in there and it would it would level the audio and it would make it sound a little crisper. But um, it's just like it's fascinating what's happened over the last ten years with podcasting. That reminds me, like what you just described, being a youngster trying to work with the tools you have to explore something you're interested in. Yeah, that reminds me of like the story I told about me in the music days mm -hmm. where it's like you had to like jerry rig some shit like okay I'm gonna take this instrumental from here and I'm gonna then I gotta record my voice now I gotta go back and do the ad libs <laughs> yeah. and I gotta rewind it. like a four track type of thing like the thing that I started recording on a few mixtapes even it looked it was about the same size as the uh, Roadcaster yeah it was made by Roland and at the time Roland it was like a little studio in a box so you had like the 1600, the Roland like 800. We had like less knobs and shit, but the screen is like this little. Yep. Looks it like still a, looks like that. It's like a Game Boy screen. Yep. And I had to mix like ostrich boots was recorded on there. Like ostrich oh, wow. boots. And I'm just like, I'm having to like do one take like for the ad lib and then I'll back up the chorus and I'm letting it play and I'm having to stay quiet on the parts. And it's like, okay, here comes the, cook, the hook. Ostrich boot, da, da, da. and if you mess up, it's like fuck. If you mess up on the third hook, you got to go back and no. start from the beginning. And then like all the shit talking, like eh, these putos are mad because I know what J Lo smells like. Oh my nose! Ah. And then the beat comes in. I'm having to do all that. Anyway, it reminds me of what you just described on the, <laughs> the iPhone 3G. Yeah. And um, so you couldn't like were you multi-track recording or was it all on one? everything was on one track no you had like you you had like um you could put the beat on this track right oh, okay so as you're mixing out mm -hmm. when it was trying to do a mix down i had to have like 
a CD burner, mm. like this Philips yep. with the blank with the spindle of CDs. So now I'm gonna press record on this CD. I'm gonna route it out. I'm gonna press play, and now I'm babysitting the knob. Like, ooh, the ad lib sounds a little loud. Turn it down. I'm like mixing the hook as it's playing. Mm -hmm. The beat. Okay, okay. You know what? I did too many. I adjusted. Stop. Start over. Let's just bring it back. New track. Okay, here we go. Ostrich boots. Okay, okay. Less adjustments. Okay, it's it sounds about as good as it's gonna get. It's not EQ'd. It's not no reverb. No, it's just no nat compressor. Nat natural. Yeah, no, no compression. Nothing. It's natural reverb. It's not mastered. Nothing. How many CDs did you go through? Uh, blanks to do stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, if you have a spindle of a hundred, I mean, you could do all kinds of shit with that. How many? Okay, here's another question. How much were CD? How much was a hundred? You think a spindle of a hundred CDs back then? <sighs> I'd have to do the math. Man. Because you would just, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking like that's that's a cost of investment back then to get a hundred, a spindle of any CDs, I mean, honestly. That CD burner was a cost. That rolling thing, my mom loaned me the money for that. Um, cheap ass microphone, cables, your turntables, if you want any kind of speakers. Um, here's a funny story. So there used to be a record pool what was it called man i forget the name of the record pool mm -hmm. but it was like dj steve nice and dj um gt uh they were on air well gt still on air steve nice went to dallas but when they would ship you like when you were subscribed for their um record pool mm -hmm. it was basically what it was is major labels let's say def jam atlantic capital whatever they would send copies of the wax of like a new missy elliott a new buster rhymes uh, vinyl they would ship it to all these record pools across the country so now gt and steve nice would have all these records at their office and then if you were part of their record pool you would get a variety pack so you'd get two of these two of those just like a bunch of new shit and ali sadiq who's like now a fucking nationally touring comedian hell yeah he worked with them so he was their boy and he was the record pool guy so when we interviewed him right here in his room Somehow, some way, he was like, "Wait, were you uh, were you in the record pool?" I was like, "Yeah." He's like, "Yeah, that maybe that's where I know you from." That's funny. Yeah, but um, but anyway, we were subscribed to that, and you couldn't just download some shit. They couldn't just email you an MP3, which is how it is now. It's like right. everything's digital, everything's Serato and shit like that. You used to li literally have to show up to the party with these milk crates or U.S. Postal Service crates full of wax, full of vinyl. And even to do our radio show, every Sunday night, we used to have to, like, park over here, unload the trunk, walk through this fucking corridor esplanade thing, down a hall, up a thing, and you're like, ah, okay, we're going on air. Damn. Or to do a house party, you're having to unload. Mm -hmm. Now it's just, you have your laptop. A fucking thumb drive or something. Yeah, like. exactly. Or, or, or the new, um, have you seen the new IMAX, the new Max? It's basically an external hard drive is a computer. It's literally as big as like, it's a little bit, it's like two external hard drives and that's your entire PC. You need to have a screen, you know, a monitor, your keyboard and mouse, and you can just carry this entire computer that's this, that's a square this big, guys. It's it's like the one I'm looking at right now to get is the M1, uh, the, the Mac M1, I think is, is what it is, iMac M1, something like that. And it's it starts at $699 for the base new Mac with the new chips and the whole new tech. That it, and it's more powerful than the $2,000 uh, iMac Pro. Which is that one? That, the, 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 the most powerful laptop. All those don't, don't hold a candle to the new uh, uh, M1s that are literally the size of an external fucking hard drive. But you still got to bring the mouse and the keyboard and a, and a screen. You do. You got you to gotta already, most people, and that's a thing too. A lot of people will have upgraded their stuff because monitors have gotten so much better. You know, if you have a, a, a Mac or a la even a laptop with a smaller, because a lot of the Mac um, laptops are small fucking screens, right? Like yours is like a 15 or 14 year inch, I think. And a lot of people have upgraded to 4K monitors and whatever, and they have a certain mouse that they like. And, uh, and maybe because they're gaming or if they're editing, they need a better keyboard because the, you know, the, the Apple ones are small. They don't have a lot of give. So people already have that shit anyway. So they just came out with these PCs that are super mobile and uh, are way more powerful than the big rigs you can buy. And it's just like, man, the possibilities of just the barrier to entry basically is so low right now to be creative or to have any kind of tech that um it's just exciting it's like you if people that want to make shit have to be so excited at what they have available especially when you got these pandemics it's like 
you want to be pandemic proof. You want to have some shit where you can still do your thing and not have to physically get up and go. Yeah. So um, when was it, Rob, when we linked linked up again, had like a little meeting? Initially? No, this like last time we met up at that co- Turkish. Oh, coffee. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that was uh, just before Thanksgiving. Damn. Okay, it was right before. Okay, that was like November. Yeah. And I had already announced like, oh, I voted for Trump. Yes. Okay. Mm, yes, 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 yes. That's why we got together. <laughs> yeah, because you're like, hey, uh, you want to lean into this thing? <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did. I was like, hey, man, I don't know what your thoughts are, but... Uh, you want to <laughs> talk some shit. <laughs> you want to talk some shit about what's you wanna going on? You want to own these libtards? <laughs> uh, I may or may not have actually said that, yes. But uh, yeah, man. You want to punk these lefty Larrys? <sighs> That's a great character, man. People love it. <laughs> and what's funny is that I hadn't, we hadn't talked probably in like the whole year we hadn't really talked since like february so like eight nine months something like that and i was just like noticing what was going on yeah i was just seeing you on social media like yeah I, yeah I go like your stuff yeah same 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 but once you started going into that direction i said to myself oh yeah one i did say yeah like the hot yeah. streets but i also said this is interesting because it gives you a whole new runway speaking about staying in your lane or working out of it and I thought to myself, and I thought about it for like a day or two. And I told Don, I was like, I think I might hit Chingo about what, you know, what he's saying. Because I would show her like, this is interesting, right? He's like, she's like, wow, that's sad. We didn't see that coming. I was like, yeah, me neither. Day went by. No one did. No one did. No one did. As, as social media tells uh, tells us. And then day went by, day went by. And then randomly at night, I, I texted Chingo. I was like, I think you were out of town, actually. You might have been at, a, at that Vegas wedding or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I was like, hey, man. And you were probably like yeah oh no you called me i think you called me and maybe you were already back and we chatted for like an hour about everything that was going on i was like you're like hey let's try it let's do it what's the worst that could happen and you took all the arrows initially and <laughs> yeah straight up sell out vendido coconut all the arrows and here we are taking it to the next level yeah man they 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 tried to crucify me, <laughs> dog. <laughs> they tried to do me like like Trump after January 6th. Fuck, man. Yeah. But hey, I, again, we you know, with our other show, we might have red pilled some people. And uh with this show, give people a little break from that. And you know, there's a lot more stuff besides politics and shit we could talk about. Oh, yeah, but, um, tons. I definitely want to get into the gaming thing. Um, I have a little studio session Thursday, and um th- uh, that that gentleman he has like a gaming system like mm-hmm. a setup like screens and shit in the mm-hmm. chair and all that and uh and it's like man it's like everywhere i look man it's like the gaming stuff is all around me bro hey man so we got to figure out a way to break it to mighty soul like i'm gonna be drinking beer with my friends playing video games leave yes. me alone <laughs> she's gonna look at me turn to me and say did you do this i'm like no ma'am i did not no ser- seriously like next time we get together to knock out a chingo chats or something like I don't know what all is required. If you got to bring like an additional computer or what what the setup is, yeah. But like, we should we should try either Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, whatever. Like, okay. hey, I'm here. Like, I don't know how to play this shit. Um, you pick the game. I don't know anything about the streaming of it. And yeah. Even if I'm fumbling around losing, um, I think sooner than later, like ASAP, I want to um, add that to the repertoire because. Like the way we started talking about in the beginning during the lockdown pandemic, it's like, man, I'm here at home. I was trying to do stuff, but I was having so many technical difficulties like OBS, trying to patch people in. I'm Mm -hmm. like, do I Zoom? I was like, do I fucking FaceTime Javi and like hold the phone like this? And like you couldn't really hear it. And I'm Mm -hmm. like getting a Bluetooth speaker. And I'm like now and it's like up on YouTube and it's like, oh, my God, so many technical difficulties. But, um, you know. There's so many possibilities too. So if you if you think you've counted me out, if you think you've counted me out, come on, man. Like this is fucking 4D chess, black belt jujitsu shit, where you can never count people out these days, especially if they have the right attitude. Because, like you just said, barrier to entry, technology. There's so many YouTube University. Learn how to use all this stuff if you've got the time and and you want to do it. I mean, you could literally take a whole years worth of college on audio video whatever you want to learn and and get it up and running photography play guitar all kinds of shit yeah and you know it helps to it helped for you to have some and me as well went went to school for business somewhat Mm -hmm. um to have some of that know-how so that when you start making this stuff ideally 
and maybe we can kind of segue into this a little bit before we wrap up is mm -hmm. having an understanding that like your art is still a business and that mm. you need to be able to produce money revenue from said art and business because that's what it is and um not necessarily be a purist 24 7 and not just be you know does that make sense an artist 24 7 because i know a lot of creatives that or musicians or little artists mm -hmm. that paint and stuff. And they're like, man, you know, I do it for the art, man. I'm like, I know, man, but you're going to be broken under a bridge if you don't learn how to monetize this art. Absolutely. Um, I used to always preach to, um, well, I preach either to other comedians too. Yeah. Like at, when I, you know, back when the open mics and shit were popping, I would tell people like, hey, I know a big part of this process is figuring out how to be funny and how to do stand up. I was like, but figure out also how to harness an audience yeah like how to gain a fan base so that you can make a career out of it and even even to like um a lot of artists and musicians there's a lot of talented people out there but sometimes what's missing is the business side yeah. so you know people say it all the time like this shit is really just 10 percent talent it's really the, the nerds are the ones that are controlling everything and and making all the bread in a lot of this stuff because they know how to monetize some shit. So, for example, off the wall example, uh, the gentleman I'm recording with Thursday, who has the gaming stuff also on the side, um, he was explaining to me, first of all, his story is very cool. When he was fresh out of high school, he went to Cesar Chavez High School. He was at a guitar center. Frankie J walks in. Mm. I don't know if they had already knocked. I think they already did Sugar Sugar with Bash. Frankie J walks in, hears him playing these beautiful chords because he grew up playing in the church. He's like, uh, you want to go on tour with me? He's like, uh, I got to ask my dad. <laughs> <laughs> and his dad's like, no, mijo, that's pendejo. You know, he's like, I need to know that I at least tried. And if not, I'm always going to have it in the back of my head that you kept me from, I might have made it. Yeah. So next thing you know, he's on tour in a band with Happy P, one of the greatest producers, in my opinion. Um, you know, Frankie and, and all these other cats. Anyway, um, oh, the business side. So long story short, you know, he was producing for people, making beats. Um, you know, this is after touring the country with them, making beats, you know, working with Manny Fresh, having a studio, charging fools by the hour to record them. He's like, he came up with this plan where he would tell people, look, I could charge you X amount per hour and shit like that, but I can do a development deal. Where you pay me, I forget what, let's just say a thousand bucks for the month, and you get, you get X amount of sessions. You can come in, we can do whatever you want. I can edit your video, we can fucking make a beat, we can, I can record you rapping, whatever. Next thing you know, he has like a, a gang of clients. So that's like a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, all of them a month. So now he's booked Monday through Friday, X amount of sessions. He's like, the money was great. It was kind of like burning me out because it wasn't like projects I'm passionate about and talented people i really believe in it's just some most of them cats with money but i thought it was genius that he said why should i do it like everybody else and just charge by the hour when i can sell these bundle artist development packages and i'm like my mind was blown i was like man i know a lot of people that have studios and they charge by the hour never have i heard someone present it and frame it in that way mm. and i was like Whoa, I was like, hey, man, you're fucking on your shit. You, you said, I'm not fitting the mold. I'm not going to do it like everybody else. I was like, Whoa. Yeah, like that's kind of one of the things with anything business related is sometimes you just have to find like a, what do they call it? like a better mousetrap. Mm -hmm. So you might have something that's working, but you just find a way to kind of redefine it or shift it in some, some way and just develop a better mousetrap, whether it's a physical product or the way you go about providing a service. It's a great example. And that's, I think we can all look at what we do and consume or maybe plan to produce or plan to, to um, serve with of how to make it a better mousetrap. Because there's really nothing new under the sun, right? I think we can all agree there's very few things that come out that you're like, that is new, revolutionary, it's never existed. For the most part, it's all been done before. It's all had its own iteration. Mm -hmm. Our job as, um, what do we call ourselves these days, conscious apes, I don't know, is to redefine things and just build better mousetraps. If it's better and it's a value, people will pay for it. I love that. I think that's a great way to end it, man. Yeah. That's a nugget of wisdom, a better mousetrap. Whether you're doing a stand-up comedy like myself and you're going city to city, tickets online right now, chingobling.com slash live. Um, you want to build a better experience, a better mousetrap. 
you know, if you're selling boots with the Nike swoosh, how can you make those boots different and better? How do you differentiate? If you're an artist, are you talking about the same old shit with the same old beats? Or do you try to build a better mousetrap? That's why a lot of these rappers got face tattoos and colorful <laughs> hair. Because they're trying to build a better mousetrap. Dude, I think there's, um, I know we're about to wrap up. I think there's five Mondays in March. This episode was so goddamn good that I kind of want to put it out to the public, man. Because okay. it was so good. Because usually there's four mon- four Mondays. We have a fifth Monday in March. Already. So if you're game, <clears throat> yeah. uh, this is a good one to put out to the public and let them know that, uh, hey guys, this is what Chingo Chats is about. This is what you can expect to hear on the Red Belt Demolis Patreon page constantly. Um, I think they'll enjoy it absolutely and give us feedback you know chime in if you're a patron you already have the patreon app and you're already going back and forth with us commenting on our posts and and leaving us messages and and checking out all the behind the scenes stuff uh you know reaping the benefits of being part of the tia you get all the other shows and please spread the word we're coming to a city near you colleen texas san angelo mission texas brea california so much more and um you know if you support us and you got our back you know, tell a friend, tell a friend to chime in, listen in, tune in. And we are an alternative. We are a better mousetrap than that boring ass terrestrial radio where they playing the same five songs over and over again. It's mostly commercials and the DJs aren't really allowed to say what the fuck they really think and feel. They're just like, trying to talk about Clorox bleach. You sound like the guy in grandma's blood. Yes, dude. We tried, wa- okay, we watched it the other night. That's, <laughs> that's one, of, one of my favorite movies. That's one of Mighty Soul's favorite movies, oh, too. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, to me, I was just like, okay, uh, it's an Adam Sandler thing. I didn't really, I was like, Nick Swartzen's in it. Okay, I'm, I'm, I enjoyed it. I had a good time. I don't think I was like, it didn't make that impact in my life at the, when it came out because there's other movies like Big Lebowski and shit like that that did that for me when I was in college and, you know, all, all my friends were into a particular movie. Like, you know, Superbad was dope, Pineapple yeah. Express, stuff like that. Even like the early Adam Sandler movies, when I was in college, all the kids were into it. But anyway. Billy Madison and stuff? Uh, yeah, I think the, I, I was probably too busy DJing. I think the other kids, I, I had work study too. I had this bullshit job on campus, which I got fired from. But anyway, Mighty Soul was like, you always do that robot voice. And I was just like, no, I don't. Yeah, She's you like, do. <laughs> no, I, I had no idea. I mean, I, not right now, I just yeah. did it. She's like, yeah, you do it all the time when you're making fun of people on the left and this and that. And, and she's like, why are you doing the robot? Why do you? She's <laughs> like, I call you out on it all the time. Why are you doing the robot voice? I was like, I never do the robot. I never do. The- yeah, dude. J- yeah, okay, JP. Call me out on it next time because I don't want to be that weirdo that can't pull chicks from uh, from grandma's boy. I'm thinking about having surgery, getting prosthetic legs. You know, yeah. it's a risky operation, but it'll be worth it. <laughs> Sit on <laughs> my face. <laughs> what did you say? Nothing. <laughs> it's time to talk about Clorox bleach. <laughs> so all right, guys, y'all be safe. Remember, positive mental attitude. This shit is all a fucking simulation anyway. You might as well think positive about it. All right, se la lavan y se toman el agua. Peace out. Sass.